Muchas gracias. Um, es un placer de estar aquí en, en México, pero disculpe, yo hablaré en, en inglés si no le molesta. Um, thank you very much. Welcome. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here to tell you a little bit about the story of Shazam. Now, Shazam, for those of you who know it, uh, it's a very, very old business. It's going to be 18 years old next month. Um, when uh, we started Shazam, it was long before business 4.0. It might, might have been business 3.0 or even business 2.0. I'm not sure. But it's extraordinary to me to see how the logic and the thinking behind business 4.0 is exactly what we have experienced as well. Let, with, without any further ado, let me tell you a little bit uh, of this story which has spanned a very long time. Uh, my name is uh, Dhiraj Mukherjee. I'm, I'm originally from India. And um, my father worked for Air India, so I've lived all over the world in uh, Europe, in the Far East, uh, in North America as well. And um, even though I'm fundamentally an entrepreneur by background, uh, what I'm passionate about is innovation. Uh, most recently, I was head of innovation for Virgin Money, which is a retail bank in the UK, and uh, looking at the transformation in financial services. So I know for many of you in the audience today, it's a challenge trying to understand and to cope with uh, Business 4.0. And I can say I've been there and I understand some of these challenges as well. Now, the gentleman in this picture is my grandfather. And my grandfather uh, was a huge inspiration for me. Uh, his name is Admiral Chatterjee, and he was uh, the Commander-in-Chief of the Indian Navy. And one of the things which he taught me when I was very young was putting your mind to a challenge. He said, if you think you can do it, it will be so. And that point of that sort of like determination is one of the messages which I took away from him. Now, we were very close, and he said many things to me, some of which I remember and some of which I don't. Uh, another thing he said, for instance, when you're in the Navy, you're often waiting for a boat, for instance, and you, you learn how to wait. And I heard this, and I listened to him, and I didn't pay much attention. Now, 18 years later in this story, now I know what he meant. So patience is also important. Um, the story of Shazam actually begins in Silicon Valley. I went to uh, Stanford Business School from 95 to 97, just when the internet was starting up. And um, like almost anyone in Silicon Valley at the time, with the fundamental change, I thought, I must be part of this revolution. And that's how I sort of fell into digital business and digital technology. Now, this is uh, a picture with uh, my business partners. And originally, there were three of us. Uh, so you can see me looking much younger back in the day, um, sitting next to my, uh, my business partner, Chris. Now, Chris and I, we were friends. We lived in San Francisco. We used to go out together. And we were bitten by the entrepreneurial bug more or less at the same time, just like many people were back in 95, 96, 97. And we thought it would be fantastic to be entrepreneurs, you know, start a business, you know, do something big, change the world. Um, but we didn't have any ideas. So we used to basically go to pubs and bars and have a few beers and try to come up with ideas. Nothing much happened out of these brainstorming sessions, except Chris would get some really bad ideas, you know. And uh, I, won't, I won't mention them, but they were, they were terrible. The good news is that he uh, was studying at Berkeley Business School, and he learned from his professor of strategy a concept which he put to use. And the, the concept was this. If you have an idea, what would make it go out of business? And um, Chris was terrible at music. We would hear songs all the time. He had no idea what was playing. And he thought, what if we could have a system where you could plug into all the radio stations which were playing in the country, and then you would know what music you were listening to? That's an idea. And then he thought of his strategy professor saying, what would put that out of business? And he thought, what if you could use a mobile phone to identify any kind of music? It doesn't have to be on the radio. It can be in a bar, in a club, in a cafe. 
that would put it out of business. So that's how he came up with the idea for Shazam. So he talked to me about it and I said, Chris, that's, that's very interesting. For once, you've come up with a good idea. But let me ask you a question. Where are we going to find the technology? And he said, oh, we'll just invent it. Now, Chris, bless him, and we're still very good friends 18 years later. But if you go to Berkeley Business School, you don't know anything about technology. Um, so that was the challenge number one. Challenge number two, I said, um, what's the business model? And he said, well, when people identify music, then they will buy a CD. And I thought to myself, buy a CD? I mean, nowadays people can go to Napster and download a song for free. It's illegal, but that's what people do. There's no business model here. He said, ah, details. So I said, okay, one more detail, one more detail. You want to identify all the music available there, right? Okay. Where are we going to find this music? And he said, ah, we'll talk to the record companies. I'm sure they can help us out. Now, it just so happened that I was a, a consultant at the time, and one of my clients was a record company. And I knew perfectly well they did not have a database of digital music. So I thought about this, and I did a little spreadsheet, and I looked at, you know, what are the chances of us inventing the technology? I don't know, 25%. Of finding a business model, 40%. Of finding a database of all the music in the UK, 30%. So I multiplied this thing through, and the number I came up with was 4%. And I thought, never mind. So I quit my job, joined Chris, and we became entrepreneurs, trying to make this dream come true. The other guy you see in this picture with the gray t-shirt uh, was my business partner, Philippe. Philippe and Chris uh, went to business school together, and we had never met. We never met, but Chris said, you know, Philippe, he is like, he's, he's like a superhero. He's got these incredible, like, superpowers. He does the work of, you know, 10 people. And we agreed to be, to be partners. So there were three MBAs, but we still didn't have the technology. So we started asking around. We didn't know anything about the technology we needed to create the service. We found out that it was digital signal processing. And it just so happened that the experts of digital signal processing were at Stanford and at Berkeley, which is where Chris and Philippe were at business school. So just happened to be in the right place at the right time. So they went and met with the head of Stanford's Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics and described to them the problem they were trying to solve. And they asked him, who are the best PhD students you've ever had? And Dr. Julius Smith gave them a list of his best students ever. And number one on that list was Dr. Avery Wang. Now, Avery, who is one of the, the best chief scientists I've ever had the pleasure to meet, was just minding his own business, you know, working on a startup, when Chris and Philippe got in touch and said, would you like to join us and invent this new technology? So he just hit delete, couldn't be bothered. But they were persistent because they had this dream and they followed up and um, he took a meeting with them, which I think was his first mistake. And the problem that we described which we were trying to solve was we want to, with about 15 seconds of music over a mobile phone handset, which is not great, with a GSM network which creates a distortion, match against a library of a million songs in as little time as possible so we can deliver a result to customers in an economic way. Now, most of the people we had spoken to said, it's impossible, it can't be solved. Avery was the only one who stopped to think about it, and that was his big mistake. As soon as he said, let me think about it, we said, that's our man, that's our business partner, and we signed him up. Now, poor Avery, he uh, was trapped with us, with uh, three MBAs, and we gave him three months to invent this technology. And he was locked in the basement of his house, 
trying to invent something which had never been done before. And it got to the point where he was about to give up. It's like he tried everything he knew, wasn't being able to come up with the answer. And meantime, his business partners were running around, writing business plans, talking to angel investors, creating financial models, projecting what this business would be, but without the technology itself. And he was in a state of desperation. He was practicing how he was going to tell us that he can't do it when he had that light bulb moment. Now, the light bulb moment, um, I believe, was in a cafe. And he overheard somebody talking about looking up a phone number in a phone book. And he thought, that's true. You know, a phone book has tens of thousands or 100,000 names, but you can find that name and phone number really quickly because you converge exponentially because you get to the right place in the book. So he tried to use that concept with music, and the idea basically was that never mind the whole song. You just look at the peaks, the spectral peaks, which have the most information. And if you match the spectral peaks from a sample of music with the database, and you find that they match over time, you get a diagonal line which emerges, which predicts with high... <laughs> That song. Anyone name that song? Anyone? Anyone? This is what uh, we were listening to back in the, in, the, in the year 2000. That was Never Ending Story by Limang. We were taking samples of, of the music in pubs with background noise and bars in London, and this is what Avery was hearing. Can we? So that was the challenge he was trying to solve. No wonder he almost gave up. But at the time, we weren't, we weren't aware of it. We, 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 didn't, we didn't know. But now we had the team, we had the idea, we had the demo, and now we could go out and start talking to investors to raise some money to build this business. And we were lucky because I think we were distinctive. People could understand the concept. They could understand what we were trying to do. And we had some fantastic early investors. So uh, Brent Townsend, who was the inventor of the 56K modem, he came on as one of our early angel investors and has been supportive of the company you know, throughout. And I still have a picture of the check which he wrote. He said, this is great. Um, here's a check for a quarter of a million dollars. Um, I'm hoping that uh, he'll look back and be pleased with that investment uh, 18 years later. We're not quite there yet, but almost. And then we started building a team. Why are they standing on their desks, you might be asking, and I, I can't answer that question. But um, you have some of the technical team, uh, our CTO, and my cousin, Michala, uh, who was the only one in the company who knew anything about music. She was non-technical. Now, for those of you who've been paying attention, um, you've been thinking, that's great, you've got the technology, but what about the music database? So it turns out, just as I had said, that there was no database of music in the UK. So we realized we had to build it from scratch. And even though we'd raised a million dollars uh, in our angel round, there's no way we could afford to fund this. So Philippe, our superhero partner, he came up with an idea. He did a, a partnership deal with the biggest distributor of music in the UK. They had 100,000 CDs in their warehouse. And at the time, uh, music was still very physical. So the deal was that we would create fingerprints of the music, which Shazam could use for music identification. And in exchange, we would have a team which would type in the names of all the songs, the artists, the albums, and everything, so that they would have a metadata database. And so we hired a US Marine called Bart, who ran a logistics operation like you cannot imagine, located inside this enormous warehouse on the outskirts of London, with these custom machines digitizing 100,000 records as quickly as possible so we could get to launch in time. At one point, we were running three shifts. So we had 
teams of workers working 24-7, just di digitizing music to create these, these fingerprints for Shazam to go to market. And we launched in August of 2002. And sometimes when I speak to audiences, they can't remember as far back as 2002. Many of you here will. When we set up Shazam, it was the dream. It was the boom. In 2001, the internet bubble burst. And there was literally blood on the streets when it came to startups. Dead startups everywhere. September 11th happened. No one was spending money. No one was buying. The stock market, the Nasdaq index, which had gone up to 5,500, came down to 2,000. And we had launched ourselves into this business, which was incredibly capital intensive. We needed this infrastructure to be able to go to market. And we were just burning cash because there was no business model. So our initial business model was charging users 50 or 60p to identify a song. And then they'd forget the number. And we were just hemorrhaging cash. And if you do that, there's only one place where you end up, and that's in bankruptcy. And we had board meetings where we would ask ourselves, are we bankrupt yet? Because if you trade insolvent where liabilities are more than your assets, that's a crime, and they can lock you up. And it's great having a dream to be an entrepreneur, but it's not so funny to be in jail. 2002 we launched, 2003, 2004, 2005, we were, the business was on its knees. 2006, nothing. 2007, 2007, something changed. What changed was when the iPhone launched. And we had been reading about smartphones. We had been talking about the internet on, on mobiles. It didn't happen for about five years after we launched. But when Steve Jobs announced the launch of the iPhone, that was a massive change for us. Finally, the service found a platform which was natural. Finally, instead of uh, consumers having to remember a number to dial, they could just download an app and press that button. Finally, instead of people saying, that's a great idea, you should be marketing the service, and I'd say, I am marketing the service. Apple helped to market us because it was a great example of what one could do with an app. And everything changed. So this is a graph of the usage of Shazam, which really took off from 2007, 2008. So to give you, give you an idea, um, for us, a, a billion uses was a big number. To get to a billion uses was mind-boggling. It took us 10 years to get to 1 billion uses. The next billion took a year. The next billion took two months. And that's what Anant was talking about, the exponential growth from finding the right platform for our service. And now Shazam has over a billion downloads worldwide. And the business model has continued to change as well. So initially it was charging consumers, which was terrible. Then we did things like we sold um, iTunes, individual songs. We were the number one contributor of revenues to iTunes. And now with the footprint that we've created, the biggest revenue stream is advertising. It's a fantastic way for advertisers to reach consumers worldwide in, in every geography. So what are some of the lessons learned? At least from my perspective, I said one, patience. Two, um, how these little moments of the coming together of technology, of the user experience, of the right platform can drive exponential growth. And Shazam is not a big team. We've not hired, you know, a thousand people, or ten thousand, or a hundred thousand. The team is a couple of hundred people. You don't need a lot of resources to have like a huge impact. Um, and the final chapter of this story, I guess, is that uh, we have an offer from Apple to buy the company as of the end of last year, waiting for approval from the the, the regulator as it stands right now. So the story is is not over. But um, it's been a pleasure for me to be able to share this journey. It's been uh, mind-broadening for me to learn about Business 4.0. And um, I hope that uh, 
Each of you has taken away something from what we've heard this morning and can apply to your businesses as well. So thank you very much. I'll be around and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.